Let me give you, let me, let me give you a completely different example, take you outside of Canada for a moment, uh, take you to northern Japan, if I could. Um, you're, of course, familiar with the, um, the earthquake that then caused the tsunami and then afterwards, of course, the nuclear disaster in northern Japan. Um, I'm working with some colleagues over there, uh, principally um, a fellow named uh, Keji Akiyama. And he's, he's been trying to understand the trauma caused by those events on children in northern Japan. And I went up with him at one point, we were over there and just trying to get a sense of the, the, the research and what he was up to and trying to support him as best we could. What you may not know is that actually more children survived than adults. And the reason for that was that the schools were inland a little ways. And the schools, it has happened at noon on a school day. And the children were evacuated up, up when the tsunami alarms went off. They, they evacuated the children as was protocol. In other words, good social policy saved the children. The parents who were down in the floodplain and in the factories, of course, didn't experience quite the same fate. What was interesting was and I want to make this a little more complicated because I'm talking about the differential impact. So how do you resolve trauma in a situation like that? How do we make, how do, in those mind, how do we facilitate resilience in this particular population of kids? And what I saw the Japanese do was one, they, it made, they managed to get people resettled. This was remarkable. They managed to get their kids back to school within three weeks. Do you know how long people were out of school in High River, Alberta? Like months and months. Do you know how long they were out of school down in, um, in uh, uh, post-Katrina? Months and months. Now you think about all the things I've said make us resilient. Connections, continuity, structure, consequences, attachment, being treated fairly and everything else. The Japanese, they had that capacity within their culture to immediately respond, get kids rehoused, try and keep them in their same school districts with their same peer groups. There was a real emphasis on continuity of attachments and engagement. All the NGOs came in and basically set up these after-school schools for these kids to attend. Now, this is really culturally specific. If you're a Japanese child, your day is basically you go to school all day, go home, get a snack, and then you go back to school all evening and on weekends. Because part of your job is to get to university. So I often hear people say, well, you know, we should instill hopefulness in children to be more robust. You don't tell a child to be hopeful you give them an experience that makes them normal again. These children actually wanted, to, well, well, they wanted to get out of their small little temporary houses with their parents as well, or other, whoever was surviving and they were living with. But they would come to these places and this, is, this gave them a program, a structure, a sense of direction in life. It gave them the relational spaces that they were looking for. After about three of these, okay, I get it, Keji, I get it, I get it. But what about like the psychology programs? And what about the right to play, soccer clubs? What about the sports field? All the things that we would do in Canada for the kids, right? And he looked at me, you know you're having a cultural moment, when, he, when my colleague looks at me and goes, Mike, why would we want our children wasting time playing? That, he's not being mean. He's being culturally relevant. I mean, that is what his frame is. And so when I hear people, you know, um, we hear mass suicide, we hear vast social problems, really wicked social problems occurring in some of our communities in Canada, whether it's here in Toronto, in some of our um, uh, recent immigrant or refugee communities that are really suffering exclusion and stuff, or we're talking about an indigenous community up north. And we respond in this extremely narrow, silly way with parachuting in mental health professionals who are going to see kids for an hour. I say there's been no negotiation the kids have not been in a mirror game with us in which they said no 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 I don't really want to see a psychologist but if you give me a genuine experience of me maybe helping to make a contribution to my community maybe I'll accept that as an intervention and so thus we really do need to see this um, back and forth um, so the course the question is always going to be you know which factors and processes matter the most to our kids in terms of their uh, particular future. And, and clearly what we're saying is we have to always attend to what level of risk exposure. Now, one last thought, I want to sort of bring this fully around. I'm going to make this even more complicated for a second, because this is actually where the science of resilience is going. And it's this. There's actually, if you actually look at this, just very simply, if you look at that, imagine a normal developmental line up above and then you have below it, let's say a child exposed to just a little bit of risk, and then they, that line that goes up and down, they, they, they hit a little speed bump in life. They hit something bad happens to them. Well, 
if you look at the difference of travel, A, we would know, of course, that an intervention is going to bump them up to normal development, right? And a child that's only coming through a little bit of stress gains from a program or intervention a little bit. But a child who's coming from a really disadvantaged space, the B, they're going to gain a lot. So my argument might be that the roots of empathy may in fact be having the biggest impact, the B, on the children who are coming from the most disadvantaged space.